Hi, I'm Angela Fair. This demonstration is going to focus on painting uh, something we would ordinarily paint with a lot of detail in a very loose and fluid way. In a previous video I painted a winter barn scene and uh, we painted it with a lot of control and attention to detail. And This is generally how I paint something that I really don't know very well. But once I get to know my subject, my passion is for painting it in a loose and expressive way. So we're going to do that in this video, um, looking at going to the other extreme. One thing I think that is important if you're painting loosely is to work on uh, the right size of paper. If your paper is too small, it's really hard to use uh, loose body movements to just really relax into your painting. So rather than that small little sketchbook, which was about five by eight, we've gone up to a quarter sheet of watercolor paper here. This is 100% uh, cotton, 140 pound cold press paper. Uh, I believe this is Kilimanjaro from Cheap Joe's Art Stuff. And it, the size I have uh, taped to my board is uh, about 11 by 15. So it's a quarter sheet of watercolor paper. One thing you wanna make sure of as you're getting started is to keep a loose uh, mindset <laughs> and uh, so you want to be relaxed when you start painting and for me that means warming up, uh, relaxing in the studio, starting to feel those creative energies flow. I don't go right into uh, I'm going to paint a loose painting today without working to get myself into that loose mindset. And so um, I've, I've done some warming up, I've splashed some paint around, check out some of my loose uh, warm ups and, and looser paintings. Uh, here on my YouTube channel, I've got all kinds of demonstrations in loose watercolor painting. One, one thing I've noticed is that it's really hard to paint something loosely if you don't know it. And so I, I've, I expect that the first time I paint a new subject, I'm going to be painting it uh, kind of tight and controlled. Until I get to know it, that's kind of going to be my default because I'm uncertain, I'm not sure about what I'm doing. So for this one, I know a little bit about this bar and I've painted it before, once before. And so I know that I have uh, a little more of a chance of painting it loosely than I did previously. I try to keep the mindset that until this painting is complete and completed to my satisfaction, it's just a sketch. It's just a work up to that final finished version that really is um, from my heart and all about me. So as we go into painting this barn on a wintry day, uh, I'm going to use some of the information that I had in my previous painting to help guide me. Uh, one is going to be the colors that I use are going to be the same colors as I used in my previous painting. And so that makes color choice simple. I don't have to think about it. I know what I used previously and I'm going to go straight there as I choose colors. I was happy with those colors. Cobalt teal, lavender, um, indigo, those were all from Daniel Smith. Quinacridone coral is my pinky kind of coral red. And um, a little bit of burnt umber. And we're going to start, I, I believe, with getting some of those frosty cool blues down um, to get that mood happening in my painting. So we're going to start with those distant trees, working with some of the lavender in my palette here. And this is a 12 inch Robax palette. It's a 19 inch diameter palette with nine, or 12 inch diameter palette with 19 wells. And I'm just going to pull that roof line out on my barn and I think I just dropped my barn down way too low. Um, debating if I can fix that at this stage. I certainly can. <laughs> I, I, I want to put my barn a little bit higher on the page. That one's that's too loose so we're gonna or too low. So we're gonna just re moisten that area and soften it out. Let that color run down the page. Turn the paper over, so that's just become my snowy bottom of the painting. And actually, I really like that. And so I'm going to get distracted and add a little bit of cobalt teal to it while it's damp here. And let some of that color flow down as well. And a little bit more lavender. And that's going to give me some soft frosty blues on my lower half of, or lower third of the painting. Now we're going to move back up here. The reason I flipped the page was because if I just moistened that, then I have a wet piece of paper and I can't get that crisp line of the barn roof that I wanted to have. So now I can go back and move up the page a bit and pull out that nice straight line that's going to be my barn roof. 
And what I just did here, we call this negative painting. Anytime you're painting around an object, you're doing some negative painting. Uh, you're painting the space around something rather than the thing itself. And that's going to help me know where my barn should be positioned. And then we drop down that hip roof, goes down like so. So now I have my barn positioned on the paper, just like that. And while it's still moist, let's put in those distant trees and then pull down this edge of the roof line as well. And the line is light enough that I could adjust it if I need to later, so that's something to be aware of. I'm not going to have a ton of sky here. I think that's going to be okay. And we drop down our hip roof on this side. Whoops, and I just made a little bobble with my brush, which I don't think is going to matter too much. That's going to be where the blue roof is anyhow. And this is where, um, as soon as we start worrying about making mistakes and getting our proportions wrong, that's when our painting starts to get stiff. So we don't want that. We want to avoid it at all costs. We want to keep things loose and relaxed. So we're going to try to use the side of the brush right now. We're building big shapes. Uh, this first layer of the painting should be all about the major shapes and getting those established. And I'm liking the way the lavender granulates. I don't have much sky in this painting. Uh, I didn't. What with deciding to move my, my barn up in the scene instead of down means that I did lose a little bit of sky. And I think that's going to be okay. Um, but I'm going to proportion this like so. Okay, let's continue by connecting our barn to the scene. What happens is here um, that if I leave this very crisp shape all by itself, I'm going to end up with a barn that doesn't look the same as the rest of the painting. So I'm going to go in with some cobalt teal and try to dig out that roof. I'm using the words dig out because I still have to kind of find it. In fact, I'm going to grab a little bit of Quinn coral right now just to help me find that roof line. Something like so. And we're going to just leave it soft and messy like that. And go back to our cobalt teal. And the cobalt till just pushed into the red. Look at that. I'm going to have all kinds of bobbly water blooms. And I think I'm going to be okay with that. The values are still very light. And we want to create texture and looseness. And a lot of that means giving up some control in the early stage of your painting. I'm going to soften this edge now, that roof line that we've so carefully carved out. I'm actually going to let it bleed a little bit as well, just to unify and connect everything in the painting together. And it looks like a great big mess right now. It's kind of scary. When we're painting loosely, we have to let the painting take over just a little bit. And at this point, that means it looks kind of wrong. Um, I'm, I actually feel like I need to stop because my, my body is tightening up. I'm getting nervous and I don't want to demonstrate uh, how to tighten up on a loose painting. Uh, that's not our goal here. We'll let it dry, take a break, reset our brains and uh, be ready to paint uh, the next layer of this very loose beginning. So there's not a lot to feel great about in this painting right now. I definitely feel like I need to uh, make some serious progress if I want this barn and winter scene to, to work. I do like the colors in my background and the texture that I have here and the simplicity of my snow. 
but uh, this definitely doesn't read as this loose and expressive and uh, interesting barn at this point. So we're going to work on that. I'm pulling out my round brush again and going back into my quinacridone coral. We're just going to see what we can do to make this barn just start to tell a story. And a good story. We want a, we want a splash of color, some vibrant, interesting and contrasts in our in our scene. Let's work on um, maybe just getting in, getting down that little lean-to area. And the re and it's kind of a focal point of the barn. There's kind of some major shapes that make this barn work. So we're going to try to see those and paint them. And I'm pitching my roof a little bit steeper than what it actually looks like in the picture. Sometimes you just got to do that with loose painting. It's all about expression over accuracy. So right now, just looking at finding a way to get that color in there, that beautiful splash of color. And, and I'm not even feeling like it's super important to get that crisscross barn door um, in the scene here. We really might not need it to make our painting work. We're just going to try it without. And remember what I said about this being a sketch. This is not my final my last opportunity to make this painting work. So this is where um, kind of what I like to think about is that when I go into a next version, that next version should be a reaction against the approach and methods that I used in the version before. And so in the version I, I did before, which you can see here on YouTube, uh, linking it up in the corner, uh, the, that version was all about detail and getting those shapes and positioning correctly. And with this version, we're rebelling against that obsession with detail. So I'm not painting my, my barn doors. And I'm not being super rigid on my uh, contours and shapes and how everything fits together. It's Got to be a little bit more loose than that. And actually that works. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that works pretty well. well. Take a look. We have here now, and I'm going to add some softness here, I think, and a little bit of blooms in. By using a juicy brush, I'm going to push some water up into my barn contours. Where that cobalt teal leaked in, uh, I've actually covered that up with the red and it just looks like a hint of shadow right now. This roof line, this edge, gives us the feeling of a barn. We don't actually have to do anything else. Uh, so that's pretty neat to see it take shape um, right now in the scene. And we're not going to worry about uh, anything else with that barn right now. Um, we're going to move right over to our fence. And I'm going to use that uh, the loose goose dagger striper brush, which is a really nice brush for painting fine lines. And I'm going to use that brush to pull my fence out uh, in the scene. And I'm using the cobalt teal again. And I'm trying to be looser again this time, more relaxed in my approach. So uh, using this pointy brush is helpful that way. And. Just wanting to, and dribbling a little bit. And as I pull the brush, you can see it gives me kind of an irregular line. It's not a perfect uh, plank. And, and I think that's, that's something that I want as well. We're going to do three planks, one on top of each another, and another one here, another one here. Spaces for the tree trunks I'm going to be painting shortly. And then a third plank down along the bottom. Uh, 
And then from there, we're gonna go right away and paint those fence posts. Instead of waiting for them to dry and having them really contrasted, um, we're just gonna put them in right now. And that way they'll blend with our fence planks a little bit which will give us a different effect. This is the, remember, this is the overreaction to the previous one. So everything I didn't do in the other, or did do, I'm responding to by doing the opposite and seeing if I can get away with it. And we could title loose painting, how much can I get away with? Because <laughs> it is kind of a big part of what we do. We try to get away with the minimum of suggestion on our objects and shapes. We try to find ways to simplify. And you know you've simplified too much when you're seen as unrecognizable and your mood and your, your objects you know, can't be identified. But it's much more often that we are a little too timid and we simplify, we don't simplify enough. And I like that little two drops of spatter there. So we're gonna just put a couple more down. While we're, while we're playing with the cobalt teal. And then from there, we had kind of need to do a little bit more with my quinacridone coral now that I've placed my fence. So we can pull some of this down into, up against the fence. Get some of those colors in here. And I've got kind of an untidy brush stroke right over here. We're going to talk about ways to fix that in a minute. So just by adding a little bit of red there, I just grounded that barn into the scene. Over here we have that messy little brush stroke. We're going to work on that in just a second. Let me grab my burnt umber. and just use it to create some of those twigs and trees that we liked. So we're gonna put some of that over here and that's gonna give us some bushes right up against the building. In fact, right up into the building. Suddenly we have a tree emerging. Actually, I'm gonna pull it right down because we're painting everything loosely while my fence, my fence hasn't had a chance to dry. So I can actually put something in front of it um, and have that color kind of blend and work. So now suddenly I have a tree right there. Uh, that's one way to deal with our landscape. More bushes and trees. Even just by tapping this dagger striper, I get some really nice grassy blades, except they're all the same size, so then you have to kind of figure out how to make them blend, make some irregularity happen. And let's put those big trees in. For that, I liked using the burnt umber combined with a little bit of indigo, just to darken it up a bit. water and I get kind of a smoky dark brown. We're going to use that to create some tree trunks and I'm going to fill that whole gap there so that's going to make quite a big tree filling in the space there. The bonus of this really long, whippy rigger brush is that you can use the side of it to make wide lines and the point to make really fine ones. That's straight indigo coming in. Just to create some shadows. And really this is where the tree becomes the focal point. Look at how dominant that tree is because it's the darkest value, the darkest colors in the painting are originating in this tree. And it's got a very strong shape. 
And then I can decide because the tree becomes the dominant shape, um, it's not really about the barn anymore. And so then we want to uh, make sure that, the, that we convey that, that our tree carries weight, it connects, uh, look how pulling this branch across the front of the barn actually gives us uh, this unity where the eye goes from the barn, which is that bright red color, follows that line to the tree, which is where the viewer is going to get keep getting pulled back into. Again, with both really dark and paler lines, we create depth in the tree, and I talk about this in my preliminary sketch my much more detailed version. And the same principles are at work here, even though we're doing a looser variation. And then we'll do another tree here. And this one we have um, not quite as big. I think we'll keep it a little bit smaller. A little bit straighter. And I'm going to keep the values a little lighter. I'm not going to put any of that dark indigo in until I've decided whether or not it needs it. And this is going to fill out this corner of the painting as well. I'm really keeping a light touch with my brush. There are times when I'm making branch marks, but my brush isn't actually touching the paper because my priority here is really wanting to keep my lines pale. Uh, I don't want to make the mistake of pressing too hard and getting a really thick uh, dark line. Okay, so I am adding a bit of indigo, but not the f not at full strength right now. The other thing that happens is, uh, and I'm going to pull in a little closer so you can see it, um, your, your branches don't all need to touch uh, the tree or even each other to still read as tree branches. No one's going to say, well, that branch is obviously blowing off the tree because it's not even touching your tree. People don't. It works. Um, it gives that impression of um, lacy transparency when some of your branches have a little less solidity to them, a little bit softer. So that's some really nice trees that help give that feeling of strength, drama, and we're going to do a little bit, I think, I think to make this work even better, I want to give a little more of a suggestion of distant trees as well. So I'm just going to mix up a little bit of a watery lavender, and I'm going to keep it quite watery, because I'm going to use it to pull up some tree forms in the background, and i because it's quite a transparent watery mixture, I can create those shapes over top of the branches that I already painted without messing up my painting. It's not too late to go in and, and just create those shapes. And that's going to give that look of distant depths. Carry it across, there's a tree in the middle, and then I go on to do the same thing in the space in between. And the same thing in the space in between here as well. And actually, you don't need to pull all the way down to the fence line. I should actually have the bottoms of those trees in, revealed as a little bit further away. And what that does is it just shows um, that the forest is a little bit farther than right. Then these trees aren't really right up against the fence line. Very simple, little transparent trees just give that little sense of depth. I could add a third layer of depth if I wanted to, um, but I don't think I do. The other thing I think I'm going to do, and it's not in my reference photo, and this is the artistic license we were talking about, is I'm going to go back with my burnt umber and create a few more twigs right here in the foreground. And in the photo, the snow is deep enough that there aren't any twigs sticking out of the snow. But in but because I have this little turquoise splatter here, um, it feels like it could use something in the foreground just to pull the eye down 
and away from these big dominant darks. So by adding a few little twigs right here, I just help balance my composition just a little bit more. Keeping it light. And that just brings the eye down. Um, and it's this mirroring of shapes. A little few, little few more twigs there. So now we have twigs leading your eye up, more twigs moving along, and then actually echoed up in these shapes as well. I could go even further. Um, you know, and add a few more twigs just in this area. Now that my barn has dried, I can place some more lines without them bleeding. And that just gives me, you know, that little bit of further structure. Now I feel like my barn, I'm actually really happy with this loose barn scene. Uh, look at how it compares to my original sketch. We have uh, a very similar scene and yet this one kind of has a wilder feel. Uh, a little bit colder, a little bit, little bit wilder. And I think that's pretty fun. But I do think my barn just wants a little bit more for it to feel um, kind of completed and have the contours that I wanted to have. So let's um, strategize how we can make our barn look a little more like a barn, like a building, while still keeping it simple and uh, loose. First thing I would do is I would squint at my reference photo and really study the barn. If you're squinting and you see the contrast between dark and light just a little bit more and they're really strong along the roof line and under that overhang. So I think that's where I'm going to go with adding those further depths. I'm going to go straight to my indigo and my quinacridone coral to create this really dark kind of blackish purple. And we're going to use that to build up some contrasts, but we're going to do it in a loose way. So I'm not looking very loose right now. I just added that line of my purple black. And let's add a little puddle of water in the area that I want to create my shadow. And this hasn't dried as much as it should have, so I might be also creating bleeds. Where'd my indigo go? Go to straight indigo and see. See if adding a lot of contrast is helpful here. You can see the color kind of thready where it hits the water and starts to bleed. And then we're going to do the same thing. Line of dark. And I'm using almost pure indigo right here. So it's very dark. We're going to add enough water so that it can flow a bit. And hopefully that gives us the looseness we need while still giving us the detail we want. Just a bit of detail. A little more indigo. And water to give, let it run. The difference here from my first version is that I'm using more water so we have more movement of that pigment. And boy does that make my barn's contours really jump out at you. Place that line and bleed it out. Same as before, just with more water. Same as before, just a little bit more. Now I really didn't paint, I mentioned this already, but I did not paint my 
my door my doors at all here and one reason I did that was because I knew that was that's a place where it's a danger zone for me if I want a loose painting I need to avoid areas that I know I'll get caught up in trying to make uh, the look of perfect detail and so by avoiding those doors entirely I set myself free from the tyranny of trying to make that a perfect detailed area which is what we get sucked into doing okay we're done I'm gonna peel the tape off and then we'll take one last look talk about and evaluate just a little bit There's a few things I want to say and the challenge with loose painting is that you're never quite sure when you're done because a lot of painting loosely means leaving some things unsaid not spelling everything out it can be really hard to evaluate your painting and just know if you should be at a natural stopping place or not so one one thing that I do to combat this is I take frequent breaks looking at my painting with fresh eyes helps me to know whether I need to add more or whether I'm content with my painting as it is and that first impression when you come to your painting after some time spent away that first impression is worth a lot because it will help you to see um, obvious flaws in your painting I'm gonna actually just um, paint a little line along my barn roof here sneaky little line and then soften it and that's just gonna you know that helped that edge pop out just a little bit more no one would notice it unless I pointed it out but those first impressions are what helps you to know what your painting needs next give your painting some time and space take a break and paint just what you see that it needs when we do this we are able to simplify and edit uh, to be more expressive in our painting without needing to say uh, to spell everything out and I'm gonna add a little bit of bark texture here just for fun as well and just a little bit of texture can will help make this tree just that much more dynamic One reason I've made it clear that my painting process is very much about painting the same thing over and over again to really get to know it is because what we feel and what we're thinking comes out on our brush when you're feeling um, out of control or you're working really hard to control your painting you're feeling unsure and a lack of confidence your paintings are going to be a lot more controlled but they're probably going to say less emotionally uh, they there's so much emphasis on accuracy that really the emotion is isn't there and so we we see so much more feeling and mood in a painting that's created out of that freedom and focus on expression coming first knowing that my two trees were going to be the counterpoint to my bright red barn and balance it out um, helped me to know where to focus my time and so I worked I went from that not very promising first layer uh, and that feeling that oh you know if I didn't paint the doors of the barn you know maybe this barn would succeed here I was able to prove to myself that I don't need to paint my doors for example I don't need to paint every detail to create a painting that's effective and evocative and that's going to give me more confidence for future paintings there's more that I could do like I said I don't I wouldn't have to call this done but my my feeling is the painting is working as a whole I'm not going to obsess and worry about the small details uh, that may or may not need to be added to the painting